Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for getting started with artificial intelligence and talent acquisition. We're going to give just about 30 seconds here for everyone to come back to their computer and get assembled, get that last cup of coffee. You now I got mine right here, uh, ready to go and share a, a great hour with you today. All right. You should now hear us live. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining today. And welcome to our webinar. My name is Steve Thayer. I'm Director of Product Marketing at Eightfold AI. I'm joined today by two wonderful leaders who will uh, introduce themselves in just a moment. We're joined by Denise Moulton, Vice President for HR and a Talent Research Leader at Burson. Uh, Denise talks to hundreds of companies just like yours every year and will be sharing their information today. We're also joined by a talent acquisition leader, Jim Batasarian, who is with UiPath, another wonderful artificial intelligence company. Our topic today, very briefly, we are going to talk about artificial intelligence, a little bit about how AI is benefiting companies and their candidates. Uh, Denise is going to share some of the findings that she has uh, from her research and the research from Burson by Deloitte. We'll learn a little bit more about what AI can and cannot do and uh, for recruiting today. I'll talk very briefly about how you can make your business case. And we'll talk to Jim about how this company, uh, UiPath, a leader in artificial intelligence, is bringing artificial intelligence to recruiting. Uh, so that's enough for me for now. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to Denise uh, to introduce herself. Uh, Denise, good morning. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Steve, for that warm introduction. And, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I am beyond excited to have this conversation. It's a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, but just really quickly, just a bit about me briefly. Um, Denise Moulton, as, as Steve mentioned, I do lead both HR and talent research for Burson, which, as you may or may not know, is a part of Deloitte Consulting. Um, but Burson is a research organization, and we do primarily prepar uh, proprietary and primary HR research. And we publish um, thought leadership and other tools and technology information um, for the benefit of our organizations who are, are members and part of our community. Uh, one of the best parts of our job, though, as an analyst and leader in the organization is just talking, like Steve said, to all of your organizations and hearing from you and learning from you. And then in turn, we like to share back our perspective and our research, which is always validated. Um, so I just wanted to also just give you all a very, very brief shop, a snapshot of who Burson is. Again, um, we have research practices that basically cover um, everything across the HR suite from you know, everything in HR and the talent space. Um, I have a, a number of colleagues that really specialize in all of these different areas that you can see on the screen. But what's interesting about our approach is that we're all, while we all have an area of expertise, we all have a passion and an interest and experience in all of the other areas that we, that we cover. So for instance, right now I focus primarily on talent acquisition, but I have a huge hand in driving HR operating model research. So it's really great how we can see how the um, HR leaders and talent leaders across the function interact and collaborate. That's just a little bit about who we are and me, and I'm just excited to uh, turn it over now to Jim, who hopefully is going to share some about his company. Jim? Hi. Yep. Thanks, Denise. Thanks, Steve. Great to be here. Appreciate it. Um, so I'm Jim Batasarian. I am a uh, global T operation, TA operations leader for uh, for UiPath. Uh, up until recently, my, so my title has changed, and I was uh, leading a group of recruiters uh, recruiting for uh, sales, marketing, finance positions in all of the Americas. Uh, UiPath is a uh, global leader in robotic process automation technologies. It's a really exciting and fast-growing space. Our company has grown from roughly 500 or so people three years ago to a little bit over 3,000. Uh, and a, a lot of that growth has really taken place even over the past year. I think at the beginning of the year, we were roughly 1,000 people. Uh, we're upwards of you know, over 3,000 people. So uh, we have really been, we're, we're, we, we, we live uh, robotic process automation technologies here, and you know, we've incorporated 
uh, automation into our recruiting process. So look forward to chatting and discussing how we've done that here. Thanks very much, Jim. So I'll briefly introduce Eightfold AI. And what we're doing at Eightfold AI is transforming talent with artificial intelligence. Our mission is no less than to help each individual unlock their potential and find the right job for them to help them uh, achieve greater personal satisfaction and uh, achieve the, the outcomes they're looking for in their career, which will benefit the world and their companies greatly. We have developed a talent intelligence platform that supports the needs of enterprises for recruiting, retention, talent engagement, and diversity all from one platform. For recruiting, a talent intelligence platform offers some fundamentally new capabilities with AI. You can screen every candidate for every position. You can rediscover great prior candidates and unlock everyone in your talent network for recruiting, starting from your own talent network rather than sourcing from the wider world. You can evaluate and focus on skills and potential to find the people who are most motivated by the roles that are available in your company and provide a candidate first, highly personalized recruiting experience. And listed last, but certainly not least, you can prevent unconscious bias to increase the diversity and inclusion in your organization. So that's just a little bit about Eightfold. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Denise, who's going to share some of her findings about AI and trends in recruiting today. As we go through, I would encourage you please to enter your questions in the window at the right, and we will have time to answer questions for any of us at the end of the webinar today. So please uh, give us your questions. Great. Thanks so much, Steve. And I, it's, it's just so lovely to hear about all of the new technologies that are out there. And you know, if you think about all the disruptions that are happening in the marketplace and the continuously evolving digital landscape, it should not be surprising that the biggest disruptor in talent acquisition is experimentation with tech solutions and new tools. And the most effective organizations recognize that talent acquisition, like any other strategic business function, can really be greatly strengthened through investment in some of these tools and advanced data-driven analytics. And as you can see here from the slide, the highest performing TA functions, and this was resulting from some high impact talent acquisition research that Burson did about a year ago, are actually two times more likely to innovate, more likely to test new processes and tools, develop capabilities, and train their people than the lowest performing TA functions. So what does that mean to be high performing? Well, in Burson speak, and when we do our research and we validate it, that means these organizations are achieving heightened business and talent related outcomes such as from a financial targets and grow capable managers. On the talent side, it's really all about their ability to attract the best talent for their organization and develop people and retain their talent. So as you look at AI and all, and all that cognitive technologies are offering, it's really this, this new world of potential for, for talent acquisition. And if the high-performing teams out there are already discovering for themselves that this stuff is, is really a game changer, it's time for the rest of the world to kind of sit up and say, OK, if the competition is doing it, I probably really need to start to get on board with AI. And that's kind of why we're here today. Now, I definitely wanted to spend just a, you know, another minute and go over some more of our research, because that's what we specialize in. And you know, one, we did that survey that I mentioned back um, last year. And one of the top findings of the survey was all about how high-performing TA functions are actually using technology um, more as a matter of practice versus having some bolt-on technology that they may play with on occasion. And they're doing this to better assess candidates, like, like Steve said, they're, they're, they're doing this to prevent possible misjudgments, which can lead to bias. And again, the most effective organizations recognize that talent acquisition absolutely needs to be in the technology game, optimizing processes, 
and, and investing in all of these advanced products. And if you look at some of these, the, the slide here, um, just th those types of statistics to, to gain that type of credibility through the use of technology, I think is just absolutely fantastic. We talk to folks all the time, and I will tell you, they say that there is a, a big awareness that technology is here and it's really helping to augment the functioning and put productivity back into the function. But one of the biggest challenges is really how do you get started and what types of questions do you ask? And that's really why we're here today is to talk about how experimenting with AI and other tools can help drive that efficiency, help make you more productive, and ultimately bring better outcomes to your organization. So we're going to continue on. And, you know, like I said, but before organizations, they have an awareness, they know they want to start experimenting. But before you start with any type of testing of new technology or bringing in a new practice into your, into your function, it's really important that you understand what the potential benefits are to you. So you can't just start something new and say, we'll see, and we hope it works. But, you know, some of the research that we've looked at at, at Burson, we're seeing that, you know, we all know that AI can really enable endless possibilities. And I actually read a white paper that predicted that AI will recover 6.2 billion hours of worker productivity by 2021. Now, one thing I can share with you is like many of you, like Jim, I was a line leader and, a, and, a, and a, I actually worked a busy recruiting desk for a good part of my career. And the one thing that killed me all the time was just the constant invisible tasks that bogged me down. And people would say, why is it taking you so long to fill that job? And, and why can't we you know, move this candidate through the process quicker? And it was things like manual scheduling of interviews and trying to you know, coordinate feedback sessions and intake sessions and you name it. And I look at the productivity opportunity, and it's really more of a productivity imperative nowadays for organizations. So, when I have started to see how AI is starting to make a lot of inroads, and we're going to go into that in a few minutes, into TA, I'm, I'm really encouraged by the possibilities, and I really believe that anything is now really within reach for our function, because we all know that we're, we're ready for some change, and we're, we're eager for something that can lend a hand. So, you know, just getting back, AI can really enhance and augment all of these, all of the human capabilities that we have. And if you think about it, a man and a machine working side by side, it, it's kind of cool and you're on the same team and, and you're really working as part of the same workforce. And, you know, if that machine can learn and evolve as we do well with things, and it's really mind-blowing that this type of intelligent automation is starting to show up across our enterprise in three ways. And it's listed here on the slide for you. But I wanted to go through it, and this is really just some context setting for all that we'll be talking about today. Um, so one of the ways is through cognitive insights. And this is really how the insights and other analytics and metrics are helping to help drive decision support and decision making. And there's also things here like pattern recognition that's happening, which is how you know, can work really closely with data mining activities to identify sequences and larger, large, uh, top, excuse me, logical grouping with data. So you think about all the data that talent acquisition already has at its fingertips that you do really nothing with, this, there's a solution for that now. Um, the next place is um, cognitive automation. And this is such as like thinking about data mining, which is really powered by machine learning. And this can help evolve with time and experiences to manage all that unstructured data that you have. And this can lead to other things like robotic process automation, which then takes routine and standardized and manually intensive high volume tasks and makes them almost invisible. So you think about some of those things that you do in terms of scheduling or forms and filling out things or helping people um, that can be really mundane and, and repetitive and, and take up all of that time. These technologies are actually freeing human capacity, recruiter capacity, to focus on more higher value interactions like things like collaboration and developing relationships and working with hiring managers. That's invaluable stuff to me. And finally, the last bucket is all about cognitive engagement. So you think about those checkbots that everyone talks about. One of, one of the big questions that we get through our, our, our members and the, the, the customers that we're talking about is, I want to have a chat bot. And that's, I probably hear that like five times a week, and it's fine. 
but they don't really actually know why they want it. And we're going to get into some of that in a bit. But this is really, you know, all about the interactions that you can have with, with users to achieve a very specific objective. So I think this is really cool. Um, that, that this is really showing up across three dimensions, across talent acquisition. But, you know, Steve, I was wondering, did you have anything to add, or Jim, did you have anything to add here just about kind of some of these three dimensions and how they're really augmenting this function? Well, what you say about freeing human capacity to focus on higher value activity is, I think, exactly, exactly right. People should not be forced to do the lowest value work they should be trying to do the highest value work, and that's a critical benefit of AI. Absolutely. And that's some of the things that we're, we, we've seen in a lot of our bodies of research. And I, interestingly enough, it's not just talent acquisition that can benefit from this. It's really across the HR suite. So, But I've found and, and see that talent acquisition is often on the front line, really experimenting with all these new technologies and, and giving, you know, setting that great positive example for the rest of the organization. So. Well, this is some great stuff, but let's dig into really kind of what we're seeing. So all of these AI-enabled tools are playing a huge role across all stages of the TA lifecycle. And as you can see from the screen here, we're going to talk about the ones that are highlighted in blue, because they're the ones that I think are really causing a lot of um, challenge <laughs> with our Burson members and with all of the companies that I, that I speak with. And, so, you know, nowadays there, there are tools for candidate sourcing that scrape information from the internet um, and platforms that administer neuroscience-based games to assess candidates against job requirements. There's intelligent chatbots, like I just mentioned, that really smooth out that application process, which we all know is a hot button for everybody. And it can really significantly start to enhance the candidate's experience and, again, save recruiter time and, and scheduling coordinator time. We all know about automated video interview systems that can analyze your expressions and your mannerisms. And they use sophisticated pattern recognition algorithms to figure out if a candidate is being enthusiastic or is being potentially dishonest. So indeed, I think the impacts of AI-enabled tools and systems are become more, becoming way more visible across every stage in the TA lifecycle. But let's start digging into what that looks like. And this is where it kind of gets fun, because I think when I start talking about AI a lot, um, of course, naturally, we think about sourcing. And, and this is what everyone wants help with, is how can I you know, develop richer and more robust pipelines really quickly? So when you look at this slide, um, the top of the slide, you know, where it starts with manual search process, that's sort of like where most people are today. You're doing things manually, you're hunting and pecking, you're posting and praying, you're hoping that you get really good applicants to your posting, and you're basically rolling the dice and hoping for the best. But AI technologies are truly transforming the way talent is sourced, allowing recruiters, again, to focus on the right candidates for the right roles at a fraction of the time. And these AI-enabled tools are, like I said before, truly a game changer. And the need for dedicated sourcing professionals may eventually fade away. Now, what's really interesting is, is a lot of folks talk about the impact of AI on sourcing. But let's, always, let's just make sure that we all remember and, and hold hands on this, is that the role of the human being and the human focus never goes away. Um, automated systems that incorporate Pattern recognition, like I mentioned before, as well as predictive analytics, are actually now able to search for candidates from multiple sources on online. Again, scraping that information that can then be useful in assessing a person's potential to fill a specific job role, and really scoring them against other profiles of successful employees. Now, you're probably saying, well, why does that really matter? Why is that important? Well, in our high-impact talent acquisition research, one of the leading findings that we had was that high-performing companies actually are focusing as much on things like candidate potential, candidate fit with your culture, and candidate values as they are focusing on your past experience and demonstrated skills. So it's really important as you start to think about how these tools can help in more ways than just giving you a much richer you know, source of candidates or pipeline of candidates. These are candidates that are going to fit better with your organization for today, for tomorrow, and hopefully into the future. And I think that is just 
I mean, one of the biggest promises that we've really seen. But it doesn't stop there. As we mentioned before, there are so many other benefits. And again, if you look at applying and screening, this is another critical part of the TA process. Um, you know, a typical application process for m in many companies is very long and frustrating. Um, but for those organizations already using intelligent automation tools, they can now start to replace those redundant steps. I know if there's any TA leaders on the phone that have ever gone live with workflow developments and, and bringing on new technologies, you know, we've tracking how many clicks it takes to get a candidate through your process. But this can really, again, help eliminate some of those redundancies. And it's also interesting to see you know, when an applicant might first download their resume and then be asked to re-enter all of that same information into require fields, that's ridiculous. It's absolutely mind-boggling how we kind of don't think about those things that can frustrate a candidate. We need to start thinking about those. But with AI, a single click can parse candidate information and all relevant materials from their resume or their profiles online, and that's just another added bonus. Um, and then, of course, there's always going to be benefits such as mobile optimization and et cetera. And this is where finding has reduced the number of people who are dropping out of your process because it's too overwhelming or long or just frustrating. And it's really, you know, nowadays, we have access to technology everywhere. And if you think about this, when you're in your personal life, you're using your, your, your tablet, your phone, anything all the time. You're on the bus, you're in the car, you know, you're at work, wherever. And you want to be able to do things really, really quickly with a, quick, with a couple of quick strokes or, or, or clicks of a button on your phone or wherever. And if you can't do that, you're going to move on. Think about online shopping. It's the same thing with, with candidates nowadays. And we've seen this, this need for this automation to be something that candidates, the career conscious candidate, is really, really um, looking for these types of um, productivity and the, these efficiencies. So if you think again about the applying and screen stage, at the application uh, stage itself, chatbots are actually helping to improve um, the applicant's candidate experience throughout the process. And they're really helping to facilitate a little bit of candidate pre-screening. So like a candidate for a retail job, for instance, might be queried about available days for work and acceptable work locations. And a well-implemented chatbot um, we're gonna, is really going to provide an opportunity for companies to personalize the application process while providing pointers on how to apply, apply successfully at a company, even you know, um, convey a sense of workplace um, culture. So you can actually build bots that make, you know, that kind of make sense for your culture. And so they're feeling like they're talking and interacting with you as an organization. So, you know, we've talked to tons of companies about how they're doing this. And we've seen organizations deploying some of these tools are gaining back tens and thousands of hours of time for their teams, especially in the larger global organizations. And they're speeding up the application process and just growing by leaps and bounds. So I think it's really, really big and important and something to be very aware of as you think about potentially bringing AI into your, into your TA process. So I'm going to keep going with some of the uh, ways T, um, AI has made inroads across TA. Um, online assessments, this is a, a really big important part of the research that we're doing right now at Burson. But uh, these online assessment tools have really changed dramatically in just a few years. As vendors have created you know, engaging games and simulations and day-in-the-life experiences and even psychological survey platforms that allow for automated evaluation of cognitive skills, things like social abilities, behavioral traits, and even more. And the AI that underpins these systems is growing more and more sophisticated all the time. So it's giving them the ability to actually match applicants to jobs and prioritize candidates accurately for recruiter outreach. So oftentimes, recruiters and, and TA leaders will ask, you know, how can you trust the AI and how can you do this? But, you know, there, there's a lot of promises here. And one of the promises of assessment technology is that it will actually do a better job <laughs> evaluating candidates who are a good fit for a given position, almost a better job than humans can do. But that's just the first phase of it. The, all that means is that it turns over this well-qualified assessed talent for a recruiter to really dig deep and go deep deeper with and, and understand their motivations and more of those human things. So I think it's really amazing how this is, when done right, 
can really push that, that process forward. Um, but beyond driving um, all of these business efficiencies in TA, many AI-enabled assessment providers are ultimately, again, increasing the Canva experience. That's the second time we've mentioned it. For example, rather than treating a hiring decision in isolation with a quick transactional, yes, you're in, nope, no thanks, the AI-enabled assessment providers are actually looking at candidates a little bit more holistically, and they may submit an application for one position in your organization, but they can actually be considered by a range of other suitable positions that are connected to the same platform, inside or outside the original organization. This ties really, really closely to that finding I mentioned about high-performing TA teams really emphasizing a candidate's work ethic and values and potential as much as skills and past experiences. And if you think about how that makes a candidate feel and how welcome they feel to be even just engaging with your organization, I think that's a huge benefit that we can't ignore. So I want to move on now just to the, the last bucket of, of what we're going to examine today of where AI um, can really make in, uh, you know, improvements to our TA process. And, you know, we've, we've talked about all the fantastic automated tools in the market that can actually schedule and conduct online video interviews. Um, we can, those are all done on demand. And surprisingly, again, the, the, the benefits to candidate experience and long term to their ultimate performance is, is just pretty crazy um, and, and very beneficial. But the idea here with how AI can benefit interview and selection is that with any game or survey-based online assessment tool, the automated, the automated evaluation is much more precise um, and, again, more reliable than a recruiter's subjective impression. So when you think about the process of pre-screening and what that looks like, and that's usually done via a phone interview, and then a, a recruiter's writing their notes down and, and considering it you know, you know, in comparison to all of the other candidates, and then you go through interview and selection, and there's more, more automation. And it, it, can be, it can be very tire, tire, tiring, and it can also be very cumbersome for recruiters to kind of balance. What's great about some of these tools is that you know, we're getting um, report outs. We're getting things um, from the tool that can help us identify of the lot who are the top candidates, and that can actually help inform the next um, step in your hiring process. So I know it sounds like it's all connected. OK, it gets them through the application process quick. It helps you do assessments really quick. It helps you interview and select quick. But if you sit there and side by side, what those, the steps in each of those processes look like without, a, without an, a different tool or without AI, and then with, I mean, it's the proficiency imperative. It's, what, it's what's coming out more quickly, more effectively, and more validated. So you know, we definitely have seen that that the screening processes and interview and selection have been greatly enhanced. And if you look at the, where you are today in terms of interview, it's very subjective. Um, it's very manual, and it's very administrative. And then if you look, up, look at where you can go with AI, you go to objective, integrated, and seamless, and focused. And I think that's probably, as a former TA leader and someone who spends a lot of time researching talent acquisition optimization, those are words that I'd want to use to uh, describe my team and my approach to talent acquisition and the function. So that was a lot. Um, and if you think that you know, you're kind of interested, you think you want to get started, I'm going to turn it over to Steve now, who's going to you know, talk a little bit about how to create that good business case for artificial intelligence. Steve? Absolutely. Well, thank you, Denise. That's a lot to think about, and I, as you're thinking about it, would love to hear your questions. Uh, a few of you have put some questions in. Uh, if you're thinking about something, please do uh, enter your question in the window at the right, and we will answer questions at the end of the hour. So I want to talk a little bit brief, uh, briefly about how to build a business case for artificial intelligence, because all of the different things that you can do with AI in recruiting you still are going to need to convince some others in your organization. And simply saying, I want AI, uh, Denise told me I need AI, and that, that's true, uh, but they may not be convinced by that alone. So here is an approach that you can use uh, that we've seen work to demonstrate the value to the business for adding AI to recruitment. Taking these items from the left, 
We'll start with filling roles faster. And this is a definite dollars and cents efficiency gain for the business. When you are recruiting with AI, you're going to be filling the roles faster that you have, whether those roles are net new to the business or are open due to attrition. When that role is open, that means that the business is going to be gaining value as soon as that role is filled. If you're hiring service people, you're going to be servicing your customers better. If you're hiring engineers or uh, line workers on a production line or product managers, you're going to be developing and delivering more products. If you're hiring salespeople, you're going to be making more money. So all of that value for each of those roles is very tangible. There's a value to the business in dollars and cents or your local currency for each day that person is in the role. With artificial intelligence, those roles will be filled much faster. We find at Eightfold that our customers are filling roles one-third faster. So if your average time to hire used to be about 60 days, that number would drop to about 40 days. Again, this is an average. But that 20 days of business time, that's, that's a month. So what is that each role worth in a month? Add that up across all the roles that you fill. And we find that for an organization that has a billion dollars in revenue as a benchmark, that value is worth millions of dollars a year, filling the, those roles faster. A second benefit, something that uh, Denise alluded to a few times, is the additional recruiter efficiency. And this is another major benefit in terms of the financial uh, outcome and impact to the business. On average, recruiters tell us that they need about half as much time to fill a role. This is the amount of time, the recruiter's time to fill the role across all of the different kinds of recruiting functions. Coordination, sourcing, uh, full recruiters. Across all of those roles, the number of hours they spend per role is reduced by about half. This can vary, of course, could be more or less than this. 50% is an average. So if you have spent about 50 hours per recruiter, uh, excuse me, per position, then that number could be down to about 25 hours with AI. That gives you, for each role, 25 hours back to recruit more people or to do higher value work. Um, perhaps you don't need to hire as many recruiters and other specialists as you continue to grow your business. However you choose to use that time savings, you are getting the dollar value of those professionals back into the business. We also see that for a billion dollar organization, that would amount to several million dollars per year in benefit. A third important benefit is increased representation of underrepresented groups. In particular, our customers report increased hiring of female candidates. And that's not the only group that can benefit, but that's often the one that our customers are interested in when they first work with us to improve their hiring of underrepresented groups. This may not be something that you attach a dollar figure to, but that's because it's invaluable. It's something that every stakeholder in your business cares about, from the board to your community, to your employees who have been so um, making such a, a big uh, amount of uh, interest in this topic, especially here in Silicon Valley. Our customers report that their increase in female representation is up to 20% higher when they're using AI tools that can help them prevent bias. The final benefit that I would suggest you consider for your business case is the reduced use of uh, underperforming point solutions. I surveyed Eightfold customers six months after going live with AI recruiting, and they told us about tools that they had turned off once they went live with AI. And they told me between three and five tools were no longer necessary, and so they stopped, uh, they stopped using those tools. This could be a variety of things, including sourcing solutions, live screening could be many different things that they no longer found that they needed. And the uh, savings would accrue back to the business. So uh, this very high level is the business case that you can make for artificial intelligence. Uh, I want to turn it back over to uh, Denise very quickly to uh, wrap up the thought about the ways that you can use AI in recruitment uh, 
So let me bring it back over to you, Denise. Great. Thanks so much, Steve. And um, you know, I think some of those, those statistics and, and the, the benefits that your customers are seeing are really impressive. So a big part of you know, what we do as part of our research is by person is we want to give you the information or your context. That's your what. What are we talking about? And then we often say you know, why it's important. But we think it's also equally important to understand how you start and how you get there. So I wanted to offer up some key considerations before you really get started with AI or any new cognitive tools. And if you like what you've heard so far and you're ready to take the leap, you're probably starting to think about, OK, well, where do I begin? And what, what questions do I need to ask? So I wanted to take a moment and bucket out kind of from a you know, logical standpoint some of the things that you may wish to consider. And this, this will change for every organization. but. First of all, data and compliance. If you're going to go live with any type of these new tools, you really need to understand, do you have the right type of data or access to the right type of data to build out the right AI capabilities? Um, and do you know a little bit more about the data? Like, for example, what kind of data will really help with aiding the machine learning? Does your tool or the vendor you, you, you end up using, do they comply with things like GDPR? Those are important things. Talent acquisition, just like you know, any other part of HR, has a lot of compliance issues. And you have to make sure that you're kind of keeping an eye on that. Additionally, you need to think about the strategy and your infrastructure. Do you nearly know what you want to accomplish if you're going to roll out a new tool or change the practice across your function? Even if you're not sure how to make this new thing work, you still need to know what it is that you want to do in the first place. And you need to be able to articulate that very clearly to your business. You can't say, I want a shiny new tool because I have a little bit of extra money in my budget. You have to tell them what the benefit will be. So lay that out. And this stuff doesn't take a lot of time. It just takes a lot of think. Next, you really have to think about the capabilities that exist on your team. And if you're going to do something, what type of training and timing and resources will be involved? So I think at this point, it's really about really does your organization, does your leader, does your team fully understand the data that you have access to. And we could talk all day about what is your one true source of data, what are the different listening channels you're using, et cetera, but we won't go there. And really, what are the organizational rules that your AI solution will need to perform the work and to get the necessary outcomes or output you're looking for? So how is that all going to work? And really, Think about, are you co-creating your solution in conjunction with your entire organization? Is it something that others will be touching or leveraging or even just having to access at time? So do you need to get your IT function involved um, with your vendor? Do you have to build a team through different training? Do you have to buy or outsource team to help with training? Do, does everyone who's going to be interacting with these new tools actually have the right skills or do you need to identify different capabilities that are needed and start to train folks? There, it's not, again, not hard stuff, but at least good to know before you get started. And finally, one area that I always feel is, is huge is you need to understand what is your implementation plan and what potential risks or pitfalls could potentially happen. Not that they will, but they might, so be ready. So have you really clear, clearly defined all phases of implementation where are you going to start? How are you going to measure? How are you going to make amendments if necessary? And how you will sustain and scale? Um, and you have to think about, will you just go live with a simple pilot to make sure it works for everyone, get the training on board, and then broadly roll out with a larger scale implementation? And how will your organization manage all the change that comes along with this? For example, you're sourcing in a new way. All of a sudden, learn. I have like. Say, whoa, slow down, because they're not used to that. Have you thought about how you're going to be communicating and change managing throughout these processes? And then really you know, define it. You know, how is AI going to make your organization more competitive 
Guys, we know the war for talent hasn't changed. It's actually getting much, much worse. It's getting really, really harder to, to hire, especially with the influx of gig workers and all of this technology and how everything is converging, which is making our jobs more and more challenging, which is why these tools are so unbelievably necessary. But we need to have the right story in place before we continue. So those are just a few little sound bites to get you thinking about, OK, now I, now I need to go back to my leader and say, here's what I want to do with AI. So we've come to um, the end of my part of the presentation, but what I think is kind of some of the, the really exciting stuff is, you know, Steve and I can tell you all day how much we love this and how much we think it's beneficial, but the benefit to you all is to really hear from a company that's truly kicking butt with it. And, you know, some of the questions that we get is, you know, can artificial intelligence really do that? And I do kind of chuckle when I hear this because sometimes I'm still looking for the answers myself. But, you know, can AI really support scale and growth? Can it give new capabilities to recruiting teams? Can it improve the experience for your candidates and your hiring managers and your recruiters? You know, those are things that are probably very well within reach. And you know, we also know that AI doesn't replace the human touch. But I really wanted to hear from both Steve and Jim on their story and their experiences with AI. So guys, over to you. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Denise, for that lead in. And uh, Jim, we're really glad that you're able to uh, join us today on the call and uh, talk a little bit about UiPath's experience with AI. I am happy to share. <laughs> it's been a process, a journey, well, and it continues. Yeah, it's fun. Absolutely. So uh, for, for everyone on the call, uh, definitely you should check out UiPath as well. Uh, this is a company that has been going gangbusters with its own set of AI solutions for robotic process automation. Um, I'd, I'd like to kick it off by just asking you, Jim, when did UiPath decide it needed uh, a new way to do recruiting? And how did you settle on artificial intelligence as uh, the direction to go? Uh, it's a good question. So I came in a little bit over a year ago, and there were some components of artificial intelligence in place. I mean, from our organization that we built bots that were transferring data from one application to another. Um, but we were we were hiring so quickly. We, we were just processing so many people that a lot of the components that we had were just not being completely leveraged. So I, I, when, I, when I came in, I took a pause and looked at the tools that we had in place, some of those uh, being the, the bots that we had built, and looking at some of the external AI applications that we had brought in, and just kind of cohesively put a plan together to tackle what was right in front of our faces. So, and Denise, I think, has, has made a couple of points around this as far as the human component. And implementing AI technologies, you can't do everything all at once, of course. I think like with most initiatives, you have to just focus in on what will make the biggest impact. So for, for us and for my team, when it came in, there were just way too many candidates to handle. We, had, we had, you know, there was a lot of buzz about the company. We, you know, we received 400 and some million dollars in, in VC funding. It puts a lot of, uh, there's a lot of interest in the organization. So we had a lot of uh, candidates coming to us. And as any good recruiting function, you know, we wanted to go after candidates that we knew would be a good fit. Uh, there are a, a, a smaller percentage of candidates that apply that are actually a good fit. I think the immediate thing that we needed to look at was how do we manage all of the candidates coming in and transform our function of recruiting from passive and screening through tons and tons of candidates, many of them just not making sense for the position, and transforming to a much more proactive uh, recruiting organization to where we were going after you know groups of candidates that we knew would be, you know, have a much higher likelihood of, of fitting the position that we were trying to fill. Um, so I, you know, that the question, uh, if I were to narrow it down, uh, I decided about a year ago when I got in. I, <laughs> it's an ongoing process, uh, but that was kind of where we started, which was looking at what the most, uh, the, the biggest impact that we could make that was causing the biggest problem uh, with the recruiting team. 
So, so much, so much volume, and clearly AI becomes a solution to address that. Um, this is a question we've gotten a couple of times already in the chat. Uh, were there specific metrics that you were looking to achieve, or specific uh, specific milestones that would tell you we've we've done what we were setting out to do with bringing in AI for recruiting? But my short. Not the best answer, uh, and you know, and Denise is right. You want to take a look at um, you know what you're trying to achieve. We were moving so quickly um, that I knew that what we had in place was broken. My team knew it was broken. We we, we happen to have a solution in place that we were you know we had purchased, so we're a little bit unique, I guess, in that sense. Um, but we we needed to leverage it more so, and I didn't go about looking at you know what the specific uh, improvement metrics would be. Uh, but we just continued to track it because what we needed to do was to start to, you know, as it started to pick up in our team, we're starting to now, it's partially why I've taken on this position, is to, is to broaden the use of AI throughout our team's recruiting functions globally. Um, so I didn't go into it with looking for any specific metrics, um, but we have continued to track improvements in efficiency you know, time to fill positions, uh, how, um, you know, the, the number of candidates that we can process, uh, the, uh, the, the, the number of positions that we fill per quarter, I think that rose 50% on average per recruiter. Um, so for me, it was, you know, looking at what we had in place, implementing it, and kind of tracking the progress in order to then start to spread it out to other parts of the organization. So 50% more positions per recruiter, uh, even if that wasn't something in advance you were looking to measure, it does sound like a, a significant outcome. Can, mm -hmm. can we double click on that a little bit? And uh, are there specific things that your recruiters can do now or different ways that they're working that you think help explain some of, some of that change? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think so we, I, we spoke about this story. There were a couple of things. I mean, we had a coordinator when I came in. We had a recruiting coordinator on our team, and I saw that function as something that was essentially, I, I like to look at it as somewhat of a waste of the human brain. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's not a position that most people stay in for a very long period of time, I, and it was something that we wanted to automate out and, and then allow that person to move into a more uh, impactful position. So we were able to take a look at automation, how could we automate scheduling, and we took that coordinator and she then started taking an active role in generating and helping with pipeline, which AI technologies allowed somebody who had really very little to no experience recruiting and understanding the type of candidate that we were looking to fill some very senior global account manager sales positions, enterprise sales positions, engineering positions even, um, by being able to match candidates to a position, we could leverage her to set up the initial outreach campaign to help manage the influx of people that were starting to come through and appropriately route them to the right position. Uh, she didn't need to necessarily understand the position, but through matching technologies, right, so through understanding that a candidate was a match for a certain position, she was then able to add value by uh, increasing our pipeline and then ultimately starting to get into interviewing candidates. So we pretty much eliminated the need for a coordinator, turned that coordinator into an additional resource to increase pipeline, increase efficiency, and I could look at you know every recruiter and from an efficiency standpoint using artificial intelligence to essentially match candidates is so impactful for candidates coming in and also for repurposing candidates that have applied at any given point in time. When we open up a new position, we don't go searching through an ATS system to try to find candidates. They automatically populate to us. We launch campaign. It happens now seamlessly. And like I said, it's, it's somewhat of an iterative process. There were components of AI that we continued to build into the process to take out the manually kind of repetitive uh, tasks of, of even you know launching a campaign. We're we're trying to get we're trying to move to almost zero clicks if we can. 
That's fantastic. Uh, really, really illustrates how the technology can actually empower the individual. Um, it's not about uh, any kind of replacement, but really empowerment. And mm -hmm. I, I'd, I'd love, if, if we can, to uh, think about some of the other individuals involved, because uh, that's a great illustration of what it means for a recruiter to become an AI-powered recruiter. Um, have you seen any any change in how hiring managers behave or how they how they react with your team now that they are whether they think about it that way or not they are now yeah. AI powered hiring managers as well. Yeah, that's a, it's a great point. It's um, something that is uh, I, I think it's ex it's extremely important. Is the look at the evolution of a recruiter. And when you start to become a really good and strong recruiter, it's not so much can you, you know, get in and can you source candidates through LinkedIn, et cetera. It's how good are you at evaluating a candidate's fit for a position? How good are you at relationships with your key stakeholders within the organization and becoming an advisor, right? And not just somebody who pushes resumes to a hiring leader. You're an advisor of talent. Uh, when you show up for a intake discussion, you, we, we, we show up with a group of candidates that are already a potential match, and we walk through candidates. We don't, we don't take this, it, our discussion points are around visualizing that, um, that candidate intake call. So we, we are spending a lot more time with more meaningful conversation with our hiring leaders to really understand exactly what they're looking for, and then ultimately do what the, you know the hard part of recruiting is is really you know narrowing a list of good candidates down and, and figuring out which candidates are the actual are the best candidates for the organization. Uh, so it, it, it puts us in a much better position of advisors uh, than than we ever had in the past. Wow. So for for you other uh, recruiting leaders. Uh, listening to Jim, what he said about showing up to hiring manager with a slate of potential candidates already ready and with a recruiter ready to have a meaningful conversation with that hiring manager. Can you imagine what that's going to mean for the impression of your team when your recruiters are able to do that with their hiring managers? That's incredibly impactful and uh, the hiring managers will, will, will love it. We, we hear that a lot. Mm -hmm. They love that. I want to ask one other question uh, so we can we can get to some of the audience questions. Have you seen a difference in the experience for candidates? Yes, uh, it's a well, it's a more streamlined approach. We're not talking to as many candidates, so we don't have to. I mean, you can get more of a white glove treatment when you're narrowing down to a smaller group of candidates, and you can move them through the process uh, a lot faster. So, I mean, my my. My short answer is, is yes. From a candidate standpoint, I mean, the ability to not have to, you know, delay in the process, and you're not interviewing so many people that it adds a delay into the process of moving through the um, the, the hiring cycle. Yeah, it's an immediate impact right there. Well, Jim, uh, thank you for sharing your your experiences. Uh, I want to very quickly turn it back over. Uh, for just a minute to Denise, um, thank you for all your questions. We, we really appreciate that. Uh, uh, Denise, did you have a final thought? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely do. And Jim, that was fantastic. Um, I, <laughs> I, 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 when I hear stories like yours, I'm reminded why I love this job and doing this type of work because it's changing finally, and we're we're kind of finally getting to a place where you think things are just going to be very, very different. Um, so you know, just as as you all think about you know what's next for your function, you have to again ask yourself these hard questions. Are you really prepared to experiment with uh, AI, and are you ready to sharpen your TA function? Do you have the right people resources um, on staff to to, to deploy? Um, and to meet these opportunities head on, and where do you really begin? Um, have you identified the needs or what you want to accomplish? Do you have the right capabilities to make this a reality? And most importantly, have, are you ready in terms of shifting your mindset from the old way of doing TA 
to, which is the post and pray, into the new way, which is highly augmented, augmented and kind of, you know, really kick butt TA. So um, that's really kind of all I had, Steve. I know we had a few questions from the audience if we want to try and go through some of these. Yes, indeed. And uh, let me ask the direct the first one to you, Denise, because I'm very interested in what what your thoughts are on this. Um, we had several questions about the metrics that organizations should be looking at in terms of their recruitment processes. Um, do you have any advice for the metrics that recruiting leaders should be measuring and trying to optimize? Well, I, I, uh, maybe uh, comment and advice, maybe. Um, so the first comment is, you know, and, and you'll actually this this is this actually pops up in a, in a lot of our bodies of research. Is you really have to have an understanding or a benchmark of where you are today. So if you're saying I want to reduce time to fill, and you're doing that by having a more robust pipeline of candidates, you really need to make sure that you understand where you're starting from, um, and then you have to identify what good looks like. So. I would say, you know, some of the things that we're hearing from the front line in terms of things that organizations are looking to improve and they're, what they're starting to measure, the, the before and the after, are things like time to, time to fully qualified slate. So from the moment a position is posted, how long is it taking them to give a good slate of well-qualified candidates to a hiring manager? Now Jim just said they're coming to that intake meeting with those candidates. Um, that's going to take some change management, too, to make sure that that hiring manager is ready. But that's one. And then um, as it relates to the scheduling component, there's always a lot of consternation around it's taking too long to set up my interview. Um, so it's really from the time that you have greenlit a candidate, how the time to get them on board in terms of that first live in-person interview is if that is the model. I can share with you a really quick example. Um, we talked to one organization, a global consumer goods organization, and they, through using cognitive technology, they were able to save, now this is a big company, so bear that in mind, they were able to save more than 50,000 work hours, and they erased months off the time it took to hire. They had to go out and hire 900 individuals for a, a leaders program they were doing. But they basically, they, they just went crazy with, with using these different tools, and they, they kicked butt. And that, that's huge. So if you think about what they were doing, they were looking for speed and efficiency, figure out what two metrics are, basic metrics, right, and look to tackle those. Build the case. Once you get the win, you keep building from there. Oh, that's terrific. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Jim, I'd love to direct another question toward you. Um, we got asked about getting started with AI, asked a few different ways. Um, how did you empower your team or convince your team to get started with AI? What, what, what works well for that uh, conversation, do you think? Yeah. Um, I mean, you can... I, I have a team. My my team was open to it because the, the things that were we, we were doing were just not working. I, it, it was a collaborative process, of course. I mean, you can't necessarily force these things on people, and, and you have to essentially take some baby steps. And, and once you succeed in one area, then it lends to another area becoming automated, and so on and so forth. I think I was fortunate, and my team had some, I would say they had an automation first kind of mindset and they were willing to take some risks. And I do think it's important that you realize that as you go through the process, there'll be failure points um, and, and we've had them, but you, you, there's an end goal and, and you just have to work through the failure points and, and overcome those and by overcoming them, meaning you, you just get better. The AI technologies, I mean, they're, they're, they are only as good as the information that you put into them. And a lot of the challenges I think that we've uh, had have been essentially just not putting enough information into a system in order to get the right results. So you just you have to work with it. You have to be flexible. You have to realize that it's going to take some time, um, and you're not going to be able to do it all at once. And, and each win then compounds itself, and it becomes easier and easier and easier. Um, you know, for us right now, I think one of the harder parts is that we've got. Um, you know, there are varying uh, you know, people within the company that uh, I think get a little bit nervous about portions of their job essentially being taken away, or you know, they are the person who is 
very, very good at uh, identifying the right fit for a position and is an AI technology just going to eliminate that and, it, and it's not. So you know, you just, there's a human component to, to deploying these technologies and it's going to be different for everybody. So we've come to the end of our hour. I, I wanted to direct one more question to, to the whole uh, panel and, and see what you think. Uh, is AI a better fit for highly specialized and high skill, high level candidates? Or is it better for high volume, uh, potentially uh, lower skill candidates? What do you think, Dan? We've had great success with both. I would say we've, our highest volume um, are inside sales people, where we've you know we've needed from zero to two or so years of experience, and those are soft skills. I uh, and you know from a, just a, a, a matching of candidate profile to the position. Uh, that, that has worked well, and when you start getting into um, very you know, complex, highly uh, skilled engineering uh, products, they're a little bit easier to use. Um, so I, I honestly have, have seen it work in both areas. I mean, yeah, I just really quickly, I think it's great for both. You know, I don't. Yeah. I don't see. I think this is this is about you know this is about help, and and you have to take it any way you can get it. For volume, it's a lifesaver. For specialty, it can be a lifesaver in different ways. Think about surfacing the best candidates, and then on the on the on the volume piece is processing all the candidates, you know, in a much more quicker fashion. Mm -hmm. I think it's awesome for everything. We see the same exact thing. We have uh, customers that use use it exclusively to hire very, very skilled engineers, uh, and we also have customers who exclusively use the technology for uh, hourly workers, uh, so it works for both. All right, well, thank you very much, everyone, for your attention and even for staying on a minute long. Uh, we will follow up with you, and we, we appreciate your time. Thank you to Denise Moulton and Jim Batasarian for joining our webinar today. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Take care.